Good evening. Junk science. It's not always the scientist's fault. Sometimes activists twist the science to fit their agenda. Lawyers twist it to win cases, bureaucrats to protect their turf. And we in the media, well, we're part of the problem too. We often take a grain of truth and run with it. This wasn't wrong, but the life, if any, was just bacteria. And they're not even sure it came from Mars. But if that were in the headline, would you still buy the paper? Still, junk science starts with scientists. And here we're all a little vulnerable because we have such faith in them. Poll after poll shows that we trust scientists far more than other professionals. It's easy to see why. Look at all the remarkable things science has done. One small step for man. Science has improved and extended our lives in so many ways, we now have an almost religious faith in science and in what calls itself science. It'll clean your teeth and curl your hair, make you feel like a grizzly bear. Who will buy their first bottle? The reputation of science is often exploited to sell unscientific junk, like the once very popular electric belt. Let's say you got a problem with your shoulder. Well, we can put this over your head. Science historian William Jarvis collects bogus inventions. Cured rheumatism, deafness, paralysis. If you're suffering from one of those, you're willing to give it a try. Going to be worth every penny. Much of the junk Jarvis showed me was so profitable, he says, because we humans are hell-bent on avoiding the inevitable. The human beings are the only creatures that have the mental capacity to imagine their own deaths. And that fear creates the dream of a magic bullet the fountain of youth, the tree of life, the, the elixir, the thing that will deliver us from that catastrophe. We have a device over here that was based on the idea of radio waves. One person theorized that diseases have frequencies just like radio stations, and we can send healing through the radio waves. If a Hollywood star was injured on a set in Italy or someplace, you could send them healing, help heal them faster. And this was hot in Hollywood. Very big, yes, yeah. I mean, when you're rich and famous and you have nothing but time on your hands, all you have time to do is contemplate your own death. You're kind of like Princess Di. You spend your day going to your massage therapist and your reflexologist and all the other quacks that have, have some snake oil for you that offers you eternal youth and beauty and immortality. It's not just the rich who get taken. The cosmetics business routinely offers us so-called experts in white lab coats who spout mumbo-jumbo that sounds scientific. But there's oxygen captured between the electrode and the gauze, and it becomes saturated ozone. All of our products have been reconstructed at the submolecular level. In my years as a consumer reporter, people tried to sell me endless quantities of scientific nonsense. This machine supposedly used chemical sprays to make people feel younger. Well, this kind of junk wastes money. At least today, most of it isn't likely to kill us. For a thousand years, however, bringing your ailments to the world's so-called experts might have killed you. They might drill a hole in your head to let the devils escape. Remember, doctor and barber were once one job. The red in the barber pole refers to bloodletting. Doctors did this for 2,000 years. Since fever made people red and flush, they thought they might cure you by releasing some feverish blood. George Washington was one of many killed by his doctors. They kept bleeding him when he had the flu. He needed that blood. He died. It wasn't until a century later that doctors started saving more people than they killed. Surgeons learned to wash their hands. We learned to do anesthesia. We learned about germs. Science was delivering big time, and we could tell the difference. Vaccines ended the terror of polio. Antibiotics ended plagues that had killed millions. We started to think science could cure everything, even colds. When a famous scientist said megadoses of vitamin C could ward colds off, people believed. <laughs> Yet, while well, vitamin C may relieve some cold symptoms, more than a dozen studies show there's no evidence it will reduce the risk of getting a cold at all. Linus Pauling won two Nobel Prizes. 
Shouldn't I believe him if he says vitamin C might prevent Mike getting a cold? Not when he gets out of his field. Science is a process that people in very narrow fields pursue, and because you're good in one doesn't make you good in everything. Yet people still believe vitamin C might prevent colds, and the pills fly out of the store. Scientific mistakes often become conventional wisdom. When I grew up, I was told spinach was the healthiest food in the world. Popeye the Sailor Man gives you instant Superman status, right? This is based on totally junk science? It's based on a scientific error, a mathematical miscalculation. <laughs> they got into the literature, they put the decimal point in the wrong place and thought they had a lot more iron. They thought they had 10 times more iron than they did. This medical journal explains a scientist simply moved the decimal point one space. So in the case of spinach, the junk science was just an honest mistake. But it's seldom that simple. Sometimes scientists have an incentive to get the science wrong. Who makes bad science and why? With spinach, it was just a mistake, but more often, shaky science isn't made so innocently. There are lots of incentives for scientists to jump to wrong conclusions. It can happen because of greed, or because a powerful empire wants to control science. Or, in the case you're about to see, it may happen because people just want fame and glory. Scientists from the University of Utah may have discovered the secret of nuclear fusion. Fusion energy has been a scientific brass ring for decades, which someday could change the world. It is that significant. Fusion is what powers the sun. Imagine being able to produce that kind of power from a cup of cold water. That is what chemists Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischmann announced they could do. We have found conditions where fusion takes place and can be sustained indefinitely. Now, discoveries of this kind are usually first submitted to scientific journals. The journal then chooses a panel of experts to examine the scientist's procedures to make sure it's good science. Pons and Fleischmann skipped this peer review process and just made their announcement at a press conference. Then they went to Congress to ask for more money. Scientists all over the world began furiously trying to duplicate the stunning results. A true discovery can be repeated time and again by different scientists in different labs. With cold fusion, however, the scientists tried but failed. At first you assume it's because you're not smart enough or not doing things quite right. And all the time these claims are coming in, bang, it works. Neutrons come out or heat comes out or tritium floods all over the place and we found nothing. No one found cold fusion. Within weeks, the promise of unlimited cheap energy began to unravel. Pons and Fleischmann were discredited in the United States, and eight years later, we still don't have cold fusion. However, the scientists did convince Toyota and some other Japanese companies to build them a new multi-million dollar laboratory in the south of France. Pursuit of fame is just one corrupter of science. Money is probably a more powerful one. You get a lot to like with a Marlboro. Look at tobacco science. The old ads are almost a joke. Cigarettes may even be good for you. Yes, according to this nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Change to camels. What isn't funny is that industry leaders still deny that science has shown that their product kills people. You were asked whether cigarette smoking causes cancer. Your answer was, quote, I don't believe so. Do you stand by that answer today? I do, sir. Do you understand how isolated you are in that belief from the entire scientific community? I do, sir. The executives ignore the evidence against cigarettes and cling to the few studies that support statements like this. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. Powerful institutions often ignore science that doesn't suit their interests. It's not new. When Galileo argued that the Earth revolves around the sun, that threatened the church's teaching that man was at the center of the universe. They arrested Galileo and told him to keep quiet about it. Established bureaucracies don't like it when their ideas are challenged. And that includes government bureaucracies. Look at the empire built on salt. 
Are you a saltaholic? We all know we're supposed to eat less salt. Like most Americans, you eat more than 20 times the salt your body needs. But do we need to cut back on salt? The prevention program at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute has been the biggest promoter of the message that we ought to cut way back on salt. They have the government churning out pamphlet after pamphlet. We Americans should eat much less salt. However, most experts we consulted don't agree with the government's message about salt. It's not clear to me that there's any evidence that a lower sodium diet is going to lead to a longer, better life. Dr. Michael Alderman heads the American Society of Hypertension, America's biggest and most prestigious organization of specialists in high blood pressure. He says some people should cut back on salt, but not most people. Eating less salt, he says, does lots of things to the body, not all of them good. And we better know the sum total of all of those things before we ask 250 million people to change the way they eat. The government isn't waiting. And this is the amount of salt they say we should limit ourselves to each day. 2,400 milligrams. It should probably be lower, but that's a reasonable interim goal. Dr. Jeffrey Cutler runs the government's anti-salt campaign. His recommendations are tough to follow. One enchilada alone or a few bowls of soup would put you over 2,400 milligrams. Three dill pickles puts you over this limit. Uh, yes, on the day that you eat three dill pickles, you'd be over the limit. I can't imagine how they came up with that number. I mean, there isn't a single bit of evidence that suggests 2,400 milligrams is better than 2,100 or 3,700 or 2,250. In the Journal of the American Medical Association, Reducing salt in diet has little effect on blood pressure. Well, I, uh, my study has not, has not concluded that. But while there's so much debate, should the government be telling people, don't eat salt? I, I don't think there's that much debate. What led him to conclude that less salt is good is that years of studies have found that eating less salt often leads to lower blood pressure. And we know that high blood pressure leads to heart disease. But this doesn't prove that less salt leads to less heart disease. If it did, you could also argue, say, that since sunbathing gives you vitamin D and vitamin D is good for you, sunbathing is good for you. Not good science. The only study that actually measured whether less salt led to a longer, healthier life was done by Dr. Alderman. OK, everybody clear? He found those who ate the least salt were four times more likely to have heart attacks. Yet Dr. Cutler ignores this new information and stands behind the studies that support his point of view. They're based on, on clinical trials, uh, randomized clinical trials, as well as observational studies. I mean, they also you gave on... some people lots of salt and followed them and saw how long they no, lived? Reduced some people's salt and followed them for, blood, for, for their blood pressure level. But not to see how long they live? No. But is, uh, I'm missing something here. Isn't that missing the point? Isn't the point whether you live longer? Well, uh, that is the point, and I think the evidence supports that. We just called up 10 leading cardiologists, major hospitals. Nine out of 10 said they don't think this is a reasonable program. I mean, nine, nine out of 10. Should we call more? Uh, I don't know what kind of sample you... Uh, people at Stanford, Johns Hopkins. It suggests you're just trying to build a bureaucracy. Well, I, I, I don't accept that. And so the government's salt campaign continues, with the government urging every single American to limit salt, even though less than a third of you actually need to. If you're in that group, your doctor's right to tell you to avoid salt, but before the rest of you give up your favorite soup or pickles, you should know that you may be doing it just because a bureaucracy doesn't want to let go. One good thing about science is that in the long run, the truth usually comes out. Now, you'd think it might help that process to bring these arguments to court. Courts, after all, are supposed to find truth. When it comes to science, however, many courts seem happy to embrace junk. Some people are in jail because of it. I was in prison 26 months. I didn't know whether I'd die in jail, but all I wanted to do was clear my name. Tony Kecko is an oyster fisherman from Burris, Louisiana. He says junk science ruined his life. I'm broke, and the system broke me. 
His trouble started one hot August night five years ago when Tony's estranged wife, Louise, was murdered. Eddie Castang is Kecko's lawyer. The body was dragged through the master bedroom into this bathroom and dumped right in the tub. Water was turned on and the body was submerged. Police had 13 suspects. Tony Kecko was one. There was nothing to connect Mr. Kecko to the crime scene. Fingerprints, blood samples, hair samples, fingernail scrapings. Kecko's girlfriend said Kecko couldn't have been there. He was with me from the time I picked him up until the time I took him back to where he was staying the next morning. 503, I have a... Investigators were stumped for almost a year. Then a new sheriff, under pressure to solve the crime, sought outside help. Dr. Michael West is a dentist from Mississippi. He says he's also an expert on bite marks. For $900, West offered to teach police departments state-of-the-art crime detection. In his brochure, West says he can turn cases that were once unsolved into police convictions. But many scientists call West's police work voodoo. Dr. Richard Suveron is a renowned forensic scientist who helped solve the Ted Bundy serial murders. <laughs> they go to him because he is going to be able he is going to be able to give them what they need. They know that if Dr. West comes on a case and says, yep, that's it, bingo, they're going to get a conviction. Sure enough, when authorities showed Dr. West pictures of Louise Kecko's body, he saw something no one else had seen, a possible bite mark on her left shoulder. So authorities went back to the cemetery and exhumed the body 14 months after Louise Kecko's death. In the morgue, West examined the body with his special blue light. This light can enhance images, but West claims it lets him see things that are invisible to the naked eye. West claimed the light showed him a bite mark. Dr. Suveron, testifying for the defense, disagreed. It's not even a bite mark. The individual that inflicted the bite would have had to have been standing on his head without this part of his head completely missing, no upper teeth marked. I mean, it is so outrageous that, that to me, it shocks the conscience. Dr. West came to court as an expert witness. He not only testified that it was a bite mark, but that Tony Kecko did it. This convinced jurors like Anna Burris. Well, he impressed all of us. He said it uh, brought the teeth marks out on her where he had bit her at. In this jail, seven days... The jury sentenced Kecko to life in prison. But while Dr. West was testifying against Kecko, he was being repudiated by his professional organizations. One suspended him, something they'd never done to a member before. The ethics committee of another voted to expel him. Kecko's jury never heard any of that. Other cases have shown West's identifications to be wrong. He said this Mississippi man, Johnny Bourne, left his teeth marks on a rape victim. Bourne spent a year and a half in jail until real science, a DNA test, proved Bourne couldn't have been the rapist. Hey, Dr. West. We repeatedly tried to interview West about all this. But he didn't want to appear in our program. And we'd like to answer some questions about your expert testimony. Do you mind if we talk to you inside? Yes, I do. I got a patient. So far, West's testimony has helped put dozens of people in prison, some for life. At least two are on death row. He's ruined my life. He's playing with people's lives. And a man like that, he has to be stopped. <laughs> How about that, huh? In Kecko's case, there appears at least to be a happy ending. The judge eventually learned that Dr. West had been sanctioned by his scientific peers. So after Kecko spent two long years in prison, the judge set him free. Freedom, freedom, freedom. But many others West helped convict are still in jail. And Dr. West continues to offer himself as an expert witness. I know, I'll talk to you later. Expert witness. What does that mean? It's an impressive title, but... How does a jury know if the expert is selling real science or junk? They are selling. Some charge thousands of dollars a day. And there are so many experts. Just look in a lawyer magazine. You'll find pages filled with experts offering testimony and all kinds of things. Because not all these experts are good scientists, not only are some people wrongly imprisoned, but useful products are taken off the market. And billions of dollars change hands based on junk science. Consider breast implants. What's the scientific evidence that they cause disease? We are the evidence! We are the evidence! We are the evidence! It's in throughout my blood system, and it's eating at my muscle tissues. We are the evidence! 
Many women are convinced that silicone from their implants poisoned them. I started having kidney and bladder infections, uh, dryness in the mouth and eyes. About a million American women have had breast implants. Some just wanted to change the way they looked. Others had breast reconstruction following mastectomies. There were complaints about scar tissue or silicone leaking, but most women were satisfied with the surgery. Then, doctors reported some women with implants have connective tissue disease. I, have, I don't sleep at night. I have pain all the time. What's happening to her is terrible and frightening. But scientifically, it doesn't prove anything about implants. Some of these women have connective tissue disease. Absolutely. Marcia Angel is executive editor of the prestigious New England Journal of Medicine. Some of them are indeed seriously ill. Just by coincidence alone, one could expect that 10,000 of them would be seriously ill. Expect 10,000 ill by coincidence? Yes. Of the women who have breast implants, about 1% or 10,000 get connective tissue disease. But that's not surprising. The same percentage of women without implants get the disease. If implants cause disease, we'd see more of these women sick. But we don't. So why then do so many women think their implants cause illness? Some women have fatigue, insomnia, uh, tiredness, joint aches and pains, what I call the symptoms of life. But when they experience the symptoms that you and I experience, they say, wait a minute, this is one of those symptoms that I've read about, and I have breast implants. Raise your hands if you've had problems. Television programs spread That's the pain. just about everybody. I'm on fire. I'm burning. I've got pain in my shoulders. Some of the women were so frightened that they actually tried to remove their breast implants themselves with razor blades. That's a measure of the fear and the desperation. Joint pain, fatigue, and autoimmune diseases are associated with breast implants. Advertisements by lawyers added to the frenzy. Lawyers brought women into court claiming implants must have caused autoimmune disease or cancer. Juries started awarding big judgments, $4 million, $7 million, $25 million. Facing thousands of lawsuits, implant maker Dow Corning declared bankruptcy. Yet even as Dow lost in court, scientists kept trying and failing to find proof that implants cause disease. We found no significant difference in the occurrence of connective tissue diseases um, between the women who had the implants and the women who did not. Studies by the Mayo Clinic, Harvard, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and others concluded that women with implants are no sicker than those without. That didn't stop the lawyers from filing more lawsuits. Rick Laminack and John O'Quinn have collected so many millions in fees, Fortune magazine dubbed them the lawyers from hell. O'Quinn says he's fighting a holy war. He's the champion of mm -hmm. these sick women, victimized by the medical establishment, people mm -hmm. like you. Yeah, yeah. Well, follow the money. Uh, if, he's, if he's fighting a holy war, he's certainly not taken a vow of poverty to do it. O'Quinn and other lawyers have expert witnesses who say the implants do cause disease. You have to look at where they come from. They're hired by the opposing lawyers. They're paid by them. They're rehearsed in advance. Two of the most influential experts are Drs. Nir Kozofsky of Los Angeles and David Smalley of Memphis. Both have tests they say detect whether a woman's immune system is affected by silicone. Juries find the experts convincing. The fact that the silicone is in the tissue and producing injury. In this case, Kozofsky's opinions helped persuade a jury to give a woman $25 million. The experts' tests fly in court, but are they accurate? Surgeon Leroy Young and Scripps Research Institute tested the experts' tests and found them wildly inaccurate. Young sent Smalley blood from women in his office who didn't even have breast implants. I tested six women who had never had breast implants, and they all tested positive. Neither Smalley nor Kozofsky would agree to appear on this program. Dr. Angel says such second-rate science would never survive peer review at a reputable medical journal. You may call these people second-rate, but they mm -hmm. sure convince juries, while the people you think are first-rate mm -hmm. aren't as convincing. That's a problem with our tort system. They don't have to point to evidence. In science, if you assert 
that say breast implants cause disease. It doesn't matter who you are. You must write it up in a paper. You must submit it for peer review. You must go through the process. You will not be believed unless you show the evidence. But in the courtroom, the opinion is the evidence. They just say, in my experience. And that becomes the evidence in the courtroom. It seems like the junk is winning. It gets the publicity. It scares in, in, people. In the courtroom. And that's what bothers me, this growing disconnect between what happens in science and what happens in the courtroom and in the courtroom of public opinion. I think this is dangerous. Coming up next, what happens when the government gets mired in junk science? All sorts of projects, some of them unbelievable, get a wheelbarrow full of money dumped on them. Who pays for it? You do. We'll show you how when we return. What happens when government policy is based on junk science? Billions of our tax dollars are misspent and people's lives altered forever. Love Canal, Times Beach, the defoliant Agent Orange. These names arouse fear because of the chemical dioxin. Dioxin is very poisonous. We know that from animal tests. Tiny amounts kill guinea pigs. That's why our government's spending hundreds of millions of dollars to protect us from dioxin. But is that good science? Just because a chemical hurts animals, does that mean it's harmful to us? Consider what happened in Italy. Twenty years ago, an explosion in a factory near Seveso, Italy, released a cloud that blew over much of the city. In the following weeks, many residents complained of headaches and diarrhea. Children developed a painful skin rash. By then, they'd learned it was dioxin and that they'd been exposed to 10,000 times the safety level. The army strung barbed wire across town. Men in white moon suits and gas masks were everywhere. And leaves on the trees were yellow. And animals started to die. Dr. Paolo Maccarelli of Milan University Hospital was among the first medical specialists sent to Seveso. Yes. What did you think would happen to people? We expected people to die. And what, we were really very, very scared. Pregnant women were told their children would be born with birth defects. A hundred mothers-to-be are said to have had abortions. Fearing that the worst health problems were still to come, some environmentalists wanted Seveso sealed off permanently. But that's not what the Italian government did. Instead, they just took the most contaminated material, covered it with plastic and about a foot of dirt, and planted trees and grass. I'm walking on it right now. Just about one foot beneath me is all that dioxin-contaminated soil and the remains of the chemical plant itself. It's buried here, too. So are the carcasses of the animals that were poisoned by the dioxin. It all sits right here in the middle of what's now a public park. It's as if the people of Seveso decided to collectively thumb their noses at all those experts who'd predicted doom. People now eat fruit from trees that grow right above the dioxin-contaminated soil. And we saw no one hesitate before drinking the water. Isn't that dangerous? Right underneath that, you have all this deadly poison. There is no problem about that. Would you let your children play in this park? Yeah, it's no problem. Researchers monitor the park and look for dioxin in the blood of mice they trap there. So far, the mice have not developed any of those feared diseases. And the people, today, more than 20 years later, they're healthy too. Many assume that by now, thousands would be dead, have cancer birth defects. That for sure, yes. Hasn't happened? No, absolutely not. Why didn't people get sick? Well, it turns out that what hurts animals doesn't always hurt people. You'd think we would have figured this out years ago, because workers in American chemical plants were once exposed to vast amounts of dioxin. They were practically bathing in it. Yet a study of their health found they're about as healthy as the rest of us. Still, 10 years after the Seveso explosion, the American EPA found dioxin had been sprayed on some roads in Times Beach, Missouri. Not a lot. The people in Italy were exposed to 10,000 times more. But the EPA destroyed the whole town anyway, demolished every house, moved out all 2,000 residents. The Environmental Protection Agency will be allocating $33 million 33 was what they said then. It's in the hundreds of millions now, and they're still spending. 
former residents can't even get near their old property. Now, this is a uh, restricted area, so we'll be able to walk around the levee right here, but really can't go into the facility. The government's uh, safety rules are Chernobyl-like. Before we were allowed into the former town, the camera crews and I had to attend a special safety lecture and sign forms saying we won't sue anyone if we get sick. Inside the gates, you see how they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars. An almost endless convoy of trucks haul contaminated soil to a huge furnace that burns it. This goes on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. After the dirt's incinerated, all the good and bad chemicals are gone, and government officials say the burned soil poses no threat to anyone. But they still take the trouble to cover it with a huge tarp. This is something a little off here. In Italy, life is basically back to normal. Here we've got gates, sentries, guards. They treat this place as if the plague lay back there. Makes you feel like you might die just being in the neighborhood. People are worried. They regularly demonstrate here. People have a right to know what they are going to be exposed to. So we've scared people and spent hundreds of millions of dollars. While in Italy, they get a park. Is the EPA at all embarrassed about this? Not a bit. William Farland, the EPA's director of risk assessment, is aware of what happened in Italy. They're going on with their lives. In America, we surround it with guards and fences and waste all kinds of taxpayer money burning the dirt. It's like you're out of control. No, not at all. We're making sure that there are not additional exposures to that contaminated dirt. And if people breathed in the dust, that would cause cancers or birth defects? We don't know that they would cause those kinds of effects. Uh, what we do know is that there's a potential for humans to respond with adverse effects like cancer. Yeah. So Italy's being careless? No, I wouldn't say Italy's being careless. Well, either they're being careless or we're being stupid. No, I don't think it has to be uh, one way or the other. All I'm saying is that there, there continues to be the possibility for human exposure if that material remains in the soil. A potential, a possibility. Of course, government agencies respond to public pressure, and lots of people around here thought the dirt had made them sick. We have medical problems that my children didn't have before we moved in. Now my son's had pneumonia twice in the last two and a half months, and today we had to take him back to the doctor because he had a strep throat again. We can't take much more. But how can this be? If the people in Italy weren't sick, why were Times Beach residents so sick? Oh, they weren't any sicker. Dr. Karen Webb, chief medical officer at St. Louis University, studied the residents of Times Beach and found they were no sicker than other Americans. They might get sick. Well, anybody might get sick. We all are going to get sick. You know, life's a terminal event. One in five pregnancies ends in a miscarriage. One third of all people get cancer sometimes during their life. It happens, and it's not related to dioxin. So why are we spending tens of millions of dollars to wall off a town and burn the dirt? Uh, it beats me. And I tell you something, as a taxpayer, I'm rather outraged. And we need to stop spending money on something that has never even been shown to cause a death. Even some of the local workers who profit from the cleanup are skeptical of the need. Well, the whole thing's a waste of time. You know? People think it's silly? Stupid. Just a waste of money. He's pissing it away, you know? What, what's the cleanup cost? I honestly don't know the figures out there at Times Beach. Do you even care what it costs? I do. As a citizen, I care. But the decision of what it costs in Times Beach is not going to influence how I evaluate the science. Why hasn't the government come to the same conclusions that you scientists have? I think that the um, government obviously sometimes makes decisions for political reasons and not necessarily for scientific ones. It sure does, and you pay for it. When we return, some surprising news about babies born addicted. Again, what we think is true isn't. Too often, what the media present as scientific fact turns out to be anything but. Consider what we heard about crack babies. Babies born to crack-addicted mothers were doomed, we were told, permanently damaged. This is something I'd heard again and again, said with such certainty. How could it not be true? Amazing 
Shamika Hales, one of almost a million children, labeled by the press, quoting experts, as doomed. Doomed to health problems, permanent inferiority. Thank you. Shamika was a crack baby. Her mother smoked crack, and 15 years ago, newspapers like Rolling Stone told us children born to crack-addicted mothers were like no others. It was worse than other addictions. The crack babies were oblivious to affection, automatons, and the damage doesn't go away. It was terrifying news. Hundreds of thousands of damaged children likely to grow up wild, dangerous, soon to reach the public schools, which would be unable to control them. The school board journal warned teachers, these children will leave your resources depleted, your compassion tested. This is something new and bad. <laughs> Fortunately, it simply wasn't true. There is no scientific proof that crack babies are fated to do worse than anyone else in later life. In fact, crack babies do better on average than children born of alcoholic mothers. You got it. They may turn out just fine, especially if they end up in good families, like five-year-old Anthony Rawls did. There you go. Keep Yet the press claimed science said that children like him and Shamika lack the part of the brain that helps make them human. It just, it, it makes me so angry just to hear that, because people don't know what they're talking about. So why do you think these people said this stuff? I have no idea, because they were stupid. Emory University psychologist Claire Coles is one of the first researchers to speak up to say that what was being publicized wasn't true. Coles had graduate students observe babies for hours. They were unable to tell which children had been exposed to cocaine. <laughs> Too much eye contact tends to overwhelm them. S somebody said that. Is it true? No. Their creepy cat-like cries, itself indicative of neurological damage. There are <laughs> children who have cries like that, but that has nothing to do with cocaine. Many the current thinking is that the original crack baby was research was flawed. What was wrong with some of this research? Well, they couldn't really tell whether they were looking at the effects of cocaine or the effects of alcohol or the effects of poverty. And everybody ignored that. They just said, this is cocaine. How could that happen? Well, they wanted to get published. It is easier to get your work published in the general press or in scientific journals if what you claim feeds someone's political agenda. Crack Babies was perfect because it met the needs of both liberals and conservatives. Conservatives wanted to demonize cocaine users. Liberals wanted more money for their programs. If you go to an agency and say, I don't think there's a big problem here, I'd like you to give me a million dollars, the probability of you getting the money is very low. When Dr. Coles dared suggest that crack babies were not permanently damaged, she was attacked viciously by politicians, called incompetent, accused of making data up, or believing in drug abuse. People confused morality and science. Well, they did. I mean, cocaine is bad, therefore the effects must be bad. Who claimed these children were damaged? Well, much of the horrible press coverage began shortly after a researcher in Chicago, Dr. Ira Chasnoff, reported that mothers were delivering babies that could not respond to them emotionally. Chasnoff didn't specifically label crack babies as automatons or claim they'd grow up to be dangerous. Other scientists in the press took his findings and ran with them. But Chasnoff did paint a dark picture of their future. These children are not normal in the sense that they're going to be able to enter the classic school uh, schoolroom and function in large groups of children. Chasnoff, who had studied only 23 babies, told People magazine the infants couldn't respond to a human voice. Rolling Stone was impressed with him, too. They called you zen-like. Right, right. <laughs> so what did you think when you read the article? Well, first of all, I will never do another interview with Rolling Stone magazine. They took him out of Secondly, context, he said, and lumped him with others, making even more dire predictions. Issues. What's quoted and picked up and delivered through People magazine and Rolling Stones is not uh, a, often the, uh, a true sense, a true interpretation of the message that we're trying to provide. But this does come from you. You didn't go out of your way to set the record straight. We found the original uncut interview you did with ABC News. Uh, the babies seem to uh, have difficulty concentrating on a task, have, um, are easily distracted by other things going on in the room. They become very frustrated very easily. 
there are a certain number of children exposed to cocaine and crack that do have every one of the things you were just talking about. But in all your groups, y y the women who snorted cocaine also drank. And so in that sense, you cannot particularly uh, tease out which is alcohol and which is cocaine. But it sounds like you don't know for sure what cocaine alone does at all. Because we're talking about the human animal, I don't think we'll ever find out exactly what cocaine alone will do because the, that human population does not exist. But I read all these interviews. You never once said these children can do just as well as anybody else. You never say that. You just talk about their problems. You, you, call, they, you are pushing junk science. Oh, <laughs> I don't think neither I nor any of my colleagues were ever uh, pushing junk science. Is everything we thought then, do we know that every bit of that is correct now? Well, obviously the answer is no, but that's the process of science. As usual, the correction gets less publicity. Even people who should know better don't. This year, Attorney General Janet Reno talked about crack babies doomed to a lifetime of problems. And Ross Perot recently said the babies are permanently damaged. This meant a lot of kids like you got labeled. It's unfair. Okay, now look at me, and do you think I have any health problems, a development you know. problem? Fortunately, the woman who adopted Shamika didn't believe the labels. Shamika was raised with the expectation that she could do as well as any child or better. Now at 18, her singing ability has gotten her parts in musicals and in opera. And she's been chosen to join a select group of students studying jazz at a prestigious school. <laughs> the original research on crack babies is a good example of what science is not. It's not a one-study endeavor. It rarely comes in a blinding flash of revelation. We learn about our world slowly, bit by bit. Scientists offer theories, and most are eventually proven wrong. By weeding out those theories not supported by evidence, we gradually build a more accurate picture of our world. It's a never-ending process. Some of what I've said tonight may be proven wrong in future years. The best we can do is look at what the consensus of scientists is. The consensus isn't always right, but it's much less likely to be junk. That's our program for tonight. Please stay tuned for Nightline following your local news. I'm John Stossel. Good night.